Uh, my guest this week, uh, Mr. Rob Petroni. Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to give your title out because you've got like 90 of them. Yeah. So why don't you do it? <laughs> oh my God, how much time do we have? Uh, about uh, an hour. <laughs> let me see. I am the president of Blues Fest Windsor, yep. which is a nonprofit. As well, I am the business manager of Lyuna 625, which is the biggest construction union in North America. Nice. Uh, so, you know, not a busy guy at all. Not at all. No, <laughs> no, but time for this. Definitely yeah, time for this. absolutely. Um, thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, obviously, your connection, uh, my connection to you was through Blues Fest initially. Yes. Um, but also very interested, sort of, because leno has got a really kind of cool story, too. Why don't we start way back at the beginning, kind of give the, the, the very basics, born and raised where? So, I'm born and raised in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Nice. Bordering Sioux, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, which... Had a lot of fun in Sioux, Michigan. And uh, in, what year was it, 87, I went to Western at, in London. Mm -hmm. And in 92, moved to Windsor just for a few years, and here I am. Nice. When you went to Western, what were you taking? Biology. Biology? Yeah. Why? Uh, so that I could pair it with psychology so I could um, train a lab rat, I guess. I don't know. Was, was that what you were kind of, you just wanted to be like scientist kid? Uh, no, you know, honestly... Uh, I really wanted to be a lawyer for something to fall back on. So I didn't want to be a lawyer. Okay. I just wanted to be a lawyer for something to fall back on. It doesn't make any sense, but when you're 18, right. what the hell do you know, right? What was, what was growing up like for you? It's awesome. Awesome. Sault Ste. Marie is an awesome place. Uh, I feel like I ripped my kids off uh, of a proper upbringing, four seasons, all of the sports, um, you know, Fishing and skiing and hockey and soccer and base. It's a great spot to, to grow up. What did mom and dad do? Uh, dad worked at the steel plant okay. uh, his entire life. And uh, my mom was a hairdresser. Okay. So that has its setbacks, as you could possibly imagine, because everybody that goes to see a hairdresser obviously knows everything. Right. And my mom used to come home and say, oh, so-and-so this and so-and-so that. And Was she a hairdresser in her own place? Uh, no, she uh, she started off, uh, I don't know where she started off, but she ended up at Sears for what seems like 100 years, and then near the end of her career just rented a chair at a local place and finished it out there. Okay. The reason I'm asking these specific questions, because it doesn't sound like there was a lot of business stuff going on in, in the house. Zero. None. Zero business. Stuff. What was, so what was, what was the home, it was just kind of like grow up, do your thing? Home life was simple, it was... Uh, mom and dad got up and went to work. Dad came home early and made dinner. We went to school, my brother and I, who he lives in Windsor as well now, um, came home, played on the backyard rink, ate dinner, played on the backyard rink, went to bed. It was Fucking simple, simple life. simple life. Yeah? Yeah, it was awesome. All right, so then when did all of this craziness start? With Lyuna or Blues Fest? Whatever, like just because, here's, the, here's what I'm asking. So. I'm guessing as a kid, you just kind of fell into like sport, you know, like you said, you yeah. just kind of went from one thing to another, right? But you seem like a guy that likes to take on a lot. So what I'm really looking for when I'm asking those sorts of questions, like I, I normally when, when I meet somebody that does the, the level of things that you do, right. the history that you hear from them is like mom and dad drove them to do this and yeah. pushed them to do that. And it seems like you might've come from a, from a different perspective. Mom and dad drove me to do what I liked. Okay. So out of high school, like I said, you, you, nobody knows what they want to do. I applied to be a pharmacist, was accepted. Applied to a couple other universities, was accepted. My father actually said to me, if you count pills for the rest of your life, you're going to end up killing yourself. It's not for you. So I, I didn't become a pharmacist, although I didn't even know really what that entailed back then. Um, I joined Lyuna. Uh, okay. right after high school and I was a construction worker and I used to work in the summers and um, and then go to school obviously during the winter months and went to school for literally seven years and um, got accepted into a law school in Detroit which is not the greatest of law schools but got accepted right and my wife and I fiance at the time had a chat and um, kind of decided, you know what, maybe another four or five years isn't the way to go. And so I'll give this union thing a shot because I really enjoyed it. And um, one thing led what to is, another. What do you mean by that? You, uh, so when you when you say you joined La Una, what, what I picture in my head is you became a construction worker and got forced into a union. I, I, <laughs> no, I became a, I went into the union, asked to be a union member, okay. signed up 
paid my initiation. They sent me to work during the summers when I was off school. Okay. Uh, when I decided to end my university career, which is awesome, you know, I could have been there for 20 years, I guess. <laughs> uh, I ran for an executive board position. Okay. And, um, and was acclaimed, actually, nobody ran against me as, as recording secretary. Right. And from there became the president, and from there became a union organizer, so I was responsible for recruiting. Uh, I was one of six recruiters in Canada. I was responsible for recruiting new members, younger members, skilled, skilled construction workers. Mm -hmm. And from there, um, our business manager, Wally Dunn, retired. I ran for his position, which is in most unions, a president's the top position, ours is a business manager, and won. And that was, God, like 12 years ago. So I, I guess the, the confusing part of it to me is like my only experience with unions, well, a couple of different experiences. Number one, you know, Chrysler or whatever, as yeah. a, you know, worked as a TPT, my parents worked on the line, I understand how that kind of worked. Yeah. And that's why I say like my experience being in a union was I showed up to work one day and they took money out of my paycheck, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the other side of that is I did some PI work that was, it was all strike related, yeah. right? Um, so I kind of stood across from the unions uh, for, for a lot of different things. And, and I've, I, I know what that side of it's like, but I guess the part that I don't understand is, is in the construction unions itself, it's, is it like, is, is it, like, are the unions competitive with each other or, like, I don't understand why you would need to recruit people. So there's, there's 13 different uh, building trade unions. Okay. So you have the electricians union, which is the IBW, you have the operators union, you have Liuna. Uh, sheet metal, you've got a whole array of them. Um, for the most part, the construction unions work together closely. Uh, we work on projects together, we, you know, building together. Um, but there are some times uh, where some unions don't get along, they argue over whose work is whose work, mm -hmm. and, and that's when things go a little bit awry. Now, this is a testy topic, but all <laughs> unions are not created equally. Right. So when somebody says, oh, I love unions, or I hate unions, or I love police officers, or I hate poli police officers, it's, it's a generality. Yeah. All unions are not created equally. Our union, people are free to join. Um, they walk in, they go through an apprenticeship program, or, or they're skilled, or they're not skilled. We welcome people that like to work hard, go to work, um, make a difference, and we like bringing in community-minded people as well. And uh, when, when my team took over, uh, we had 400 members, about 250 of which weren't working. And okay. today we have about 1,700 workers, all of which are working. So we did things a little bit differently, branding. Uh, we stay away from the negative stuff for the okay. most part. We try to be positive in the community. We try to, to you know, back positive things and stay away from negative things and just brand ourselves that way. It almost seems to me that like, so when, when thinking about like the Chrysler, or the, the Ford model, or like the factory model or whatever, to me it almost seems like the, the union works for the company. It yeah. seems like in construction it's sort of the opposite, in, in a way. In construction, the owners of construction companies are partners with Lyuna. Okay. So, for example, we have a, a pension plan with $8 billion in it. Mm -hmm. The construction companies borrow money from our pension plan. Okay. In turn, they hire our members, which in turn pay money into their pension plan. And it, you know, we're actually partners with it. I have a staff of 17 people. Okay. And their job is to obviously take care of the members and make sure everybody's getting paid properly, which they are. Right. And uh, show up and, and help people out with their day-to-day -day stuff that maybe is outside of work, like benefits and um, getting a, a legal opinion on something. My job mostly is dealing with owners. Okay. Um, figuring out, okay, you're busy, um, you need more people, where are we gonna get them from, how are we gonna train them, or you're not busy, how are we gonna get you more work? Uh, so it's, it's more of a partnership. Okay. We have a lot of people that come to us that are not union, that don't work in the construction industry, that want to unionize with Liuna. And 100% of the time we say, sorry, we're, we are a construction union, this is our model. And I'm talking locally now, not North American wide. Mm -hmm. This is what we focus on locally. Um, and you bring up a good point. Um, 
you know, if you're a, if you're a tire factory in Windsor and you unionize, uh, the union has to negotiate with the tire factory. Yeah. The tire factory can always say, we're just going to go to Detroit, mm -hmm. we're going to go to Mexico, or, you know, we're going to go to another country, we're going to shut down, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And construction is different. In construction, you can't build the road in Mexico and bring it to Windsor. Right. Now, the interesting thing is, in Windsor, in construction, say the road, the people that are doing your sewers and water mains and roads, they're all union. Right. So if somebody from out of town comes into town and bids work for the city, that is not union and gets the job, it's the contractors, it's the owners that call me right. and say, okay, this isn't cool, this is not fair, either unionize them or get them out of here. Right. So we work very closely with the contractors. Okay. It's, it, it's, it's funny because like, it's, and I, I hate to almost go down this road because I, I, I don't want to put anything disparaging on it, but like the only thing that I know about like construction unions almost to me seems like garbage unions, mafia stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And it, it, it's a lot of like, it, and it's, to me, it seems like there's just, it's a way more interesting sort of, cause like I said, I've always thought of unions as like the opposition to the company where yeah. in, in your case, it almost seems like the union is what creates a lot of the business in some cases. Absolutely. So, you know, the construction company needs 80 workers and they need them trained and they need them with all their health and safety certificates and their their scaffolding certificates and their forming certificates and Lyuna pays for all of that. So when the contractor calls us and says, hey, we need somebody with this skill set and all of these safety certificates, mm -hmm. that's what we provide. If somebody calls us and says we need a cement finisher, we don't send them a pipe layer. We send them a cement <laughs> right. finisher, right? Whereas when you're hiring off the street, uh, if you can find somebody, right. uh, because we've taken them all, um, <laughs> They're not coming with all those credentials. Right. And then anything being upgraded, we also do uh, for free for the company as well. Right. Our members actually pay into their own training fund. Okay. Our members pay into their own benefits fund and their own pension fund. So the company has nothing to do with any of that. We own all of that. Okay. So if a company goes out of business, we're fine. Right. Because the benefits and the pension are the benefit fund and the pension fund. They go to work at a different company. It's the same benefits, same pension, same training. Right. So we are a different model. I, I like the model that we have and um, nothing against any other unions because I still think in today's age they are um, necessary. But I don't think I'd be able to work for a different union. I like the one yeah, that we see, work for. And, and that's the thing. Like, And I told you what my background was, right? So, yeah. you know, working on the factory, but then also, and a big part of it, was working on the other side of the, you know, working on their strike lines and stuff. And, yeah. and seeing, you know, like, for example, you, you talk about Sudbury, Falcon Ridge, went on, which is outside of, anyway. Or no, <laughs> you, you talked about Sault Ste. Marie. Falcon right. Ridge is in Sudbury, sorry. Um, they went out at one point for over a year, right? Mm -hmm. Falconbridge, they shut, they shut the place down. They said they weren't going in for the contract that was offered for them. They were, they were gone out of work for, uh, for over a year. The, the town almost fell apart because yeah. it's, it's the main source of income. And then at the end of it, they went back for a contract that was less than the one that was originally offered. Yeah. And when I saw stuff like that, like I really looked at it like the, the the entire that and you know the classic story that you hear about you know like a, a guy steals four engines off a line and then when it comes to, back to contract time suddenly that guy's back in and i've never looked at that as a benefit yeah so that, that's a good point and that's how we're different so uh somebody steals something from work in a def, in a different union and it's the union's job to get that person's job back because that's their livelihood right we in Windsor have 400 companies for our members to choose from to work for. Yeah. They go to work. They don't like the boss. They get laid off. We send them to a different company. It's not, we don't have to file a grievance to get them back to the company they don't want to be at. Yeah. And vice versa for the owners. Somebody goes to work and, and listen, it happens. You, you, know, you go to work for a company and it's not a fit. And you go to work for the second company and it's not a fit. But then you find that company that you're there for the rest of your life. Right. We don't have to grieve every time somebody gets laid off. We don't have seniority. Right. So you can work for a company for 20 years and it gets slow, you, they can lay you off on Friday. So if our members aren't out there working hard and showing up for work and doing what they're supposed to do, they know they can get laid off. And it's a shortage of work situation. It's not a grievable situation. So did all of this come to you just because it was the shit that was sitting in front of you? Uh, no, no, it was, you know, I, I worked out in the field. I saw, you know, some things that I, I felt needed to be changed. Okay. Um, 
I had some, some really good mentors across Canada, actually, that steered me in the right direction and, and decided, you know, I, I, think, I think I can make a change. I think I could do it differently. I surrounded myself with a, with a great staff. You know, when I, when I took over, uh, we had two other people in our office and the office was literally 300 square feet. Now we have 17 people, we have a training director, we've got an organizing staff, uh, support staff, benefits staff, pension staff, uh, an apprenticeship program that's recognized uh, by the government. Uh, we are literally the St. Clair College of the Construction Craft Worker Apprenticeship Program. Uh, so things, things started to roll, people wanted to join. It's funny, I have, you know, I would wear a Lyuna jacket and people ask me if they could join. And I say, sure. And then they ask me what we are. <laughs> so, so I think the branding is working because everybody sees it in a positive light. Right. right? They see us out in the community and we're backing things that are important to the community. And tell me some, tell me about the branding. Cause that was kind of, was that your baby? Um, so I, I, I mean, I started looking at things differently years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but then Lyuna, um, in North America and, and especially where I work, which is central and eastern Canada from the Ontario to the east coast, um, hired a branding agency, okay. CBIO. And, you know, we started off as the Labor's International Union of North America Local 625. Oh, it falls right off the We tongue. went to <laughs> Lyuna Local 625. Now we're at Lyuna 625 and eventually in another six months or a year, we're just going to be Lyuna. Everything you see now is pretty much Lyuna. Yeah, that's uh, it, it's it's funny because so I, I guess I shouldn't say it's funny. The did the branding stuff sort of push the Blues Fest stuff, or was it the other way around? So the branding certainly helped. Right, it was it was one of the parts of the decision, but really it wasn't that complicated of a situation. Right. Um, in a nutshell, this is what happened. Blues yeah, Fest. Because let's let's be frank here. There's a bunch of people that are watching this interview right yeah. now, going, "All right, let's yeah, yeah. hear it." Yeah. So there's a but there's a lot of misinformation. There's a uh, small group, a small vocal group that uh, that doesn't like the the turn that that Blues Fest took. Mm -hmm. But again, when you talk about branding and rebranding and changing with times, it's something that had to be done. So basically, this is what happened. Blues Fest International was a festival that was a for-profit that was run for 20 years. Yep. They no longer could do it anymore for a whole host of reasons, most of which not good. Mm -hmm. So they tried to sell it. That's when I got involved. Nobody wanted to buy it. Nobody wanted to take over the model. So what they then tried to do was donate it. Nobody wanted to, it to be donated. Um, a bunch of the sponsors got together, including me, saying, okay, listen, can... Can we take it over? Can we start something new? What do we want to do? Mm -hmm. Everybody else, let me rephrase, all of the smart people said, we want nothing to do with this. We'll be sponsors, but we want nothing to do with right. this. Here's our money, now go away. So I went, <laughs> I went back to the drawing board and spoke to my wife, Carol, and um, said, you know, this is a challenge. It's something great in the community. Everybody likes it. Uh, it does have its challenges um, with ticket sales and the crowd and vendors and suppliers. It's a huge challenge. Uh, you're a stay-at-home mom. The boys are getting older. Would you like to take this over? And reluctantly, Carol said yes. <laughs> and here we are five years later. So we started a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We put an executive board together, and every year our... Um, volunteer base grows. And honestly, in the last five years, we have met the salt of the earth people from this community. We've gained so many friends from it. Um, people pour their hearts into this. It's all volunteer. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets paid. And when I say nobody gets paid, I mean nobody gets paid. Obviously, you know, sound and lights and and uh, bartend. We pay everybody. But the volunteer group, the which is about 75 yeah. people now, um, they, they do it for the love of it, the challenge of it, and to, to keep something alive in Windsor. As you know, you know, a lot of festivals fail. Yeah. Tell me about the experience for you. 
Because it's not all, because like I said, you and I both, though, it hasn't been, I mean, it hasn't all been sunshine and roses for you. Yeah, so Blues Fest, Blues Fest International was a festival where uh, there was no such thing as ticket sales. So if you sponsored Blues Fest for $5,000, you'd get $25,000 worth of tickets. Those people would hand their tickets to their people, who would hand them to other people, who would hand them to the next group of people. And next thing you know, you just have a bunch of people coming for free to a festival, not buying a pop, a water, a beer. And the, and the model was failing. Okay. So when we took it over, we had to switch it over to a paid event. Obviously, if you want better bands and, and uh, bigger names, you, you have to pay. Mm -hmm. um, although we kept the ticket sales very low, uh, I would argue $30 is certainly not a lot to pay for a ticket when you can, you know, you go to Detroit, pay 75 bucks to see a concert. Right. Um, and in the first year, I can tell you, we sold uh, $1,500 worth of tickets, 1,500. And our band budget was 60000 So uh, we came up with an idea of, of selling VIP tents. Okay. And we have corporate sponsors that purchase a tent. A tent is $10,000. They get 200 VIP bracelets for their own tent, their patio area, their own washrooms, their own bartender. They get $500 worth of food catered for, in from the other place for free. And we started building it like that while we were selling tickets. So year one was 1500 in ticket sales. Year two was 3500 uh, Year three was 16000 Big jump. Last year we were at 70000 <laughs> And this year we've already doubled that. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. So do you, what's your back like? So I know you got involved with the festival through I'm gonna the love unit. this question. Yeah, yeah, but like, what's your background? In, like, do you have a background in music? Is it something that you're interested Zero. in? Zero. 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 All right, so now all, the, now all your haters are really throwing Absolutely. shit at this. Okay. Zero background in music. All right. Love music. Uh, love going to, to live venues. Yeah. Don't have a favorite genre. Right. At all. You'd be surprised at the. the, the I'm not surprised at all because I'll tell, I'm gonna tell one of your secrets, and this is one of the things that I know about you. I, from time to time, will find myself down on the streets of Olet Avenue just playing my guitar. And I've seen you and Carol out. Yeah. And I've seen you guys wandering around. And I've seen you walk into just about all the places. The most surprising place was a couple of weeks ago. I watched as the two of you walked into fucking Imperial. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and, I and I love Justin. Justin's been on the show. Excellent dude. Um, and I actually would love to go to Imperial just to see what it's like. But I was amazed to watch the two of you walk in there. Really? Yeah. yeah see, little known fact, um, you would most often find me at an EDM music festival. No shit. Myself and every other 21 year old in the province of Ontario. Nice. You're yeah. a raver kid, huh? I am. So <laughs> thankfully, thankfully I didn't, um, I didn't learn about raving right. until about six or seven years ago <laughs> or else I'm telling you, I'd probably still be raving. Oh yeah. That's your thing. eh? <laughs> That's my thing. How did you find it? So I have a buddy in Toronto. Yeah. Um, I have a few buddies in Toronto and my first experience was at the government. Went to the government in Toronto okay. and saw Fetty Legras. And then from there, we ended up at Veld Music Festival, Miami, Las Vegas. And, it, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's actually a model that is okay. brilliant from the outsider looking in and from somebody trying to throw a successful festival. All of the artists support each other. There's right. no infighting. So one day one artist is a headliner, the next day they're the supporting act, but they're still supporting each other. Then you add in the sound and the lights and the experience, and it's just a completely different, different concert to go to, right? Um, I'm one of the ones that believe they're extremely talented. They come from the musicians first, and then, and then DJs second. So I like everything. I was just in Nashville uh, for the first time, and I'm not a huge country music fan, but I really enjoyed the live music. Yeah, you, you seem... Like a bit of an explorer to me. Yeah, I don't, so much, so, you know, my wife and I are a little bit different this way. Um, I don't see, I don't see myself as a 50 year old man. No? No, if I go to an event with 50 year olds, I'm fine. If I go to an event with 21 year olds, I'm fine. Yeah. I don't, I don't see it as a barrier. If I, if there's something that I want to go to, I go. What is it that you're looking for when you're out for these things? Um, I like new ideas. So anything that I see at a different venue that I can add to, 
to Blues Fest. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like a fact-finding mission. It's 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 always a learning experience. We're always adding new things every year. Mm-hmm. We're always trying to improve. We don't just sit on our laurels. And we do take feedback from people that come and say, the lights were too bright, you need more food, um, things like that. Um, so I think I think when I go, I, I do study the venue and the event to see how in fact we can make it bigger and better see it's funny because it the way you describe that sort of it the first thing that comes to my mind is like when i when i go out and because i kind of do the same thing right i'll just go wander around looking to yeah. see what's going on and i always felt like a fucking weirdo <laughs> right like just because i'm the dude in the room that nobody knows and hey what the hell is he doing but and the other thing too that i would do is i would show up to to, to shows because i love live music and when i would when I, I still do it as soon as the band plays i don't care what's happening in the room i go right to the front of the stage yeah. and i just stand there and and the problem is is like i'm the worst kind of fan because i don't i don't jump i, I you well now i'll dance around and stuff but like <laughs> I, usually and in, in my history more so than now I would just stand there and stare, like just yeah. watching what's happening. And it was like, to me, it was the most amount of respect that you could possibly be, be given. But now that I've spent a little more time on the other side yeah. of it, I realize how kind of weird it just is. Do you, do you find yourself? No, I'm the opposite. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm like atypical and um, I don't know, I'm an odd duck. So when I go to a venue, I sit back and watch the entertainer and the crowd. Right. So I'm watching to see, okay, what's the crowd like? Are they enjoying this? Are they purchasing a beer? Did they sneak their own beer in? <laughs> um, you know, how's the bar doing? How is the food doing? What kind of crowd do you have to bring in to make everything work? Um, clearly at Blues Fest, we don't push, you know, coming and drinking 15 beers right. and going home. But on the other hand, you, you do want money. somebody that's going to come and spend a little bit of money, either support the, the food vendors that we don't make money off or buy a pop or a water or, or a beer. T-shirt. Uh, that was one thing I was really impressed because I, I, last year was the first time I'd really gone down to the festival and seen it like ever. Yeah. Um, and when I saw the giant trailer pop out with the, with the branded T-shirts, I'm like, oh, right. that's, that's fucking genius. Why yeah. is it like... Yeah, and we, and, and we, we make money on uh, ticket sales, mm-hmm. beverage sales. And everything else, we allow the vendors to make their own money. We don't take a piece of the food. We don't take a piece of the T-shirts. We found uh, somebody now that is, well, you saw him last year, that is awesome. Yeah. Uh, great product, nice trailer. Uh, and every year we add something like that for the fan experience. We're not making money off of it. Right. It could be argued we're losing money off of it because if you're spending 20 bucks on a T-shirt, you're not spending 20 bucks on a pop and water right. and beer. But it's all about the experience, and as long as uh, people return, which they have, every year it gets bigger and it's the same people, um, and then they bring their friends and they bring their friends, uh, I think we're onto something with a, with a winning model. Every now and then, uh, I have to remind myself not to listen to the um, vocal minority. Mm. Uh, for example, last year I wanted to do this 90s thing, and I know it's called Blues Fest, but if you look at Blues Fests around the world, they've all had to morph. And if you look at the local festivals in town, they're all out of business. If you don't change, you're going to die. And four days of blues, God bless, um, you know, the music affectionados. Four days is a long, a lot of time to be spending at a festival. So if you can find something for somebody to enjoy one day or two days, even three, that's great. On day four, even somebody like me is... Yeah. It's pretty exhausted, and I don't need to go back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's weird, too, because it's... And I don't know the specific, you know, it, like, the, the people who are specifically... Uh, I just know that it's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was funny to me when you when you initially announced the, the hip-hop night, mm-hmm. the 90s night, I, like, there was nothing but joy that washed over me. Like, it's, to me, that just seemed like, okay, cool. Like, because I get it. You know what I mean? Like, I get the blues fest. Like, I'm, yeah. a blues, I'm a blues musician, yeah. right? Like, I understand. You can barely get people to come to a bar at some point. Right. How are you going to get them to show up to four days? Right. And to me, and, and 
it's I don't, I don't I'm sure this argument's been made. Like Western music is all just variants of blues anyway. Absolutely. Like so, where did the, where did the concept come? Like because this is an already a touring thing that you attach to the blues fest, right? It is. It yeah. is. There's there's uh, back to the '90s. I love the '90s. It's it's the same variation of ten or twelve artists, and and we decided on five of them. Right. Um, and next year, quite honestly, we're probably going to do a different five. Yeah. It's that much of a success. But there's two, there's two things that I looked at. So last year, I was talked out of it. Okay. And we did fill the tents. Yeah. Because it was a blues day. And so we had 2,000 people in the tents. But we sold 50 tickets online. Okay. 50 for Sunday. Yeah. Um, so what I did this year was I decided, okay, you don't want a back to the 90s day. So let's, let's bugger this whole thing up. And let's do a blues day with a back to the 90s day. Right. So we put Beth Hart on from 6 to 7.30. Right. And then we put Vanilla Ice and CNC Music Factory on after Beth Hart. <laughs> so I know, first of all, Beth Hart is incredible. Right. Um, I know all of the blues people are going to come to Beth Hart. And I know that there's a lot of people that don't know who Beth Hart is that are going to come early to see Vanilla Ice. Right. And they're going to see Beth Hart and they're going to say, holy shit, this isn't actually really good so maybe next year I might pick up a Friday ticket to see Bonamassa if we get right. it so I think it's going to help generate ticket sales the second part of it is we're bringing in um, so far to date 4,000 people that never even heard of Blues Fest before right. because of the 90s so once they get there and they see the venue and they see the staff and the cleanliness and the actual setup I think it's we're going to make it grow now we have secured the weekend before uh, this year, so the weekend before Blues Fest, we've secured. So now we have two weekends with a week in between. Mm -hmm. This year, we're going to use that that weekend for setup so that we don't have to kill ourselves <laughs> and rush. And we are in. Wait, you're bringing rush? No, we are. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we are in discussions right now about possibly doing two weekends or ten days. That would be so amazing. Which does a lot locally in that we can literally almost showcase every local band. You also, you now compete directly with like the Freedom, whatever the fuck they call the Freedom Fest now. <laughs> They've switched it like nine yeah. times. I, I don't keep up with this though. But you're, you're now competing with that kind of event. And it's, I, I think like a 10 day festival becomes like an entirely different game. I believe so. Is that something you're excited for? It's a challenge. Everything's a challenge. Yeah. Right? So we do it for the, ch I do it for the challenge. Um, I'm not happy, um, you know, knowing that it's going to be a success. I'm always pushing the limits yeah. and, and my team is with me at all steps. I mean, they do pull back every now and then and say, okay, that's a little bit out there. But, you know, when we took it over, the, the band budget was, it was sixty-five dollars or $70,000 and the total budget was hundred and twenty grand. This year, our band budget, Forget the rooms and the food and the riders. Right. Our band budget is five hundred thousand, and to put the event on is a million dollars. Wow. Um, I said I wanted to get to a million. We just hit the million, and next year I, I think we're going to double it again. Wow. I really think we're going to hit well, two million dollars. Well, especially if you end up going if you go ten yeah. days. Yeah, or even add an extra day or two. Right. Yeah. We're, we're looking at bringing. We wanted to see will people buy a ticket. Yeah to a big name act. Right. And the 90s is not cheap. It's, right. a, it's an expensive act. Um, you know, Eddie Money is not cheap. Johnny Lang's not cheap. Beth Hart's not cheap. So we're upping it. And, and it seems to be working. So next year we might bring in that 250, $400,000 act. One act. Since you're one of the guys bringing in those level of names here in the city, do you like do you have conversations with like the casino and and that kind of stuff? Like, is yeah. it is it uh, is it a what's the the phrase I'm looking for? Like, is it a, a cooperative yes. experience? Yes. So I, I work with um, Kalamazoo that throws a blues fest. I met them a few years ago, and they are a blues fest, like a true, true, true blues fest. They didn't do very well last year, but they're revamping this year. Um, I work with the casino uh, as well. Um, I work mostly with the Ottawa Blues Fest. So we're continually working on acts that we can route because they're at the same time as us, mm -hmm. as is Kalamazoo. So if I can get in a big name act um, that Ottawa can have the next night, 
it works out for us. We get the artists a little bit cheaper when we route them. So, yeah, definitely uh, it's collaborative with other festivals and, and everybody kind of works off everybody else's success. So why do you do this? Challenge. Yeah, but yeah, no, that's that, that's not good enough because you you could you can find a challenge anywhere. You had a challenge yeah. just running Leuna. True, right? True. So there's challenges there. Why do you do this? So if you talk to Carol, my wife, and Burroughs, yeah, they do it for the community, right? It's all community, community, community. So when somebody steps outside the boundaries and and shits on the festival, um, they take it to heart. It hurts. As yeah. as I do because I'm the one that books the band. So when somebody says, "Oh my God, the you know Vanilla Ice, that's bullshit," mm -hmm. I mean I take it to heart a little bit. So the entire team does it for the community. They don't want to see another festival lost. Mm -hmm. It brings in a ton of tourism. We think we have a gem down there at Festival Plaza. All of the artists tell us it's one of the best venues they've ever played at. I do it for that, but honestly, it's the challenge. I, I, I'd like to see a festival in Windsor that is like a multi-million dollar tourist destination, and, uh, and, and it's for charity, so we, we do give money to charity. Um, nobody gets paid, although, you know, this year we set $100,000 aside to help pay for the 90s act, mm -hmm. and the rest went to charity. And if, I, if we can grow this thing into something huge that, you know, people all over North America are coming to, and it's starting, that's starting to happen. We mm -hmm. can see in our online ticket sales where people are coming from, and they're coming from everywhere. Um, it'd, be, it'd be nice to be able to pass it on to the, to the next executive board of the nonprofit to say, okay, we started this, it's something we're proud of, and... Hopefully you can carry on. So what do you want to get out of it? What do you want to What do you want to see from it? Like when when all said and done, Robin, you're you're climbing into your your final bed there. Yeah. What do you What do you want to leave behind? Is that even a concern? Like is that a thing that you think about? Yeah, I want to see a I want to see a four day headlining act with um, Kid Rock, Bob Seger, and those type of acts headlining all four days. That that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. Slowly we're getting there. Uh, we did have, you know, a really, really big act this year. Um, well, uh, it was Steve Miller that at the last second, uh, we're always competing with Detroit, right? Yeah. So as soon as we put in an offer, they shop it, which is great. That's yeah. what the agent's job is to do. And um, and we, we had a choice. We had to take Steve Miller and Peter Frampton um, in order to get both of them. Right. And the dollar amount was just, yeah, it was just, you know, oh, you talk about challenge, <laughs> sure, but it was like, all right, I, I don't want to really put money from my mortgage into this thing to float it. And, that's uh, a weird, that's a weird <laughs> offer to have in front of you. Look. Well, they tour together. You either get Steven, you either get nothing or you get Steven Miller, Steve Miller and Peter Frampton and you're going like, mm. <laughs> yeah, Peter Frampton would be huge. Exactly. Steve Miller would be huge. Exactly. And I have to get both yeah. playing together. I mean, they tour together, right. so I, it I get sense. it. Yeah. And if I could, if we could have afforded it, um, we would have done it. Right. And we could have afforded it but if then, we raised the ticket prices. Right. But you're always cognizant of the fact that people, you know, it's it's their hard-earned money, and can you charge fifty or sixty dollars for a ticket? I don't know. Totally We're at thirty. Weird. We know we can get thirty. Um, and we have to find different ways of bringing in uh, community-minded corporate sponsors to help us keep it at 30. Right. That's... Hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I, I think you guys have such an interesting story. And it's the, the little bit of... I shouldn't say little bit because here's the thing. The, the vocal minority that, that we've talked about, <clears throat> they've got a place too. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't think when they say whatever it is that they say about what's going on with the Blues Fest, I don't think that they're coming from a place where they're like just trying to shit on you. I, I try to tell myself that as well. And, yeah. and I think it's, it's like anything else. You know, if, if, you, if you start something from scratch and you're building this thing and you're creating this thing and then somebody says something negative about it, it you, you kind of every now and then... Get your hackles up. Well, you, you, you take it personally, yeah. right? You're like, oh my God, what am I doing wrong? Until you run the people who are saying it, and for the most part, 80% of them are the same 80% that you see on the Windsor Star page yeah. and every other page, they're experts in everything. So you're like, okay, now I get it. Yep. Um, it's just negative Nancy. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to yeah. do with Blues Fest. It's just negative Nancy. So when you start running those people, there's a beautiful thing about social media is you can actually run 
the people. Yeah. Right? And you can see year over year over year. Oh, yeah, it's the same 30 people. Right. The same 30. You for, I forget names from one to the other, but God it's, bless. It's funny because this just happened to me the other day. There was a, a comment that came in on something we did. I don't even remember what it is now. But it was like it was a, like a, a fairly negative comment that was like, this might be a legitimate complaint. Yeah. And then I went back and looked at the person who said it and went like, oh, shit on this, shit yeah. on this, shit on this, shit on this. Yeah. Never has anything good to say. It's tough to take the negative criticism when you can't show me that you understand what positive is. So to that point, that brings up a great point. There are people that, that say negative things that are right. That's right. And we listen. So I remember in year two, we were talked into by somebody that we shouldn't have been talked. We were talked into a VIP area. Okay. And that did not go over well. Yeah. At all. So we literally got rid of the person that came up with that idea. Oh, was that, was that the, like there was a barrier up front or whatever? Yeah. Cause I remember that like there was, that was actually a trend in ticketing for a while where yeah. they were like doing golden seating yeah. ticketing or whatever. Yeah. yeah we yeah. thought. We thought, okay, there's a bunch of people that really want VIP. Yeah. Let's give them VIP. But the people that go year after year after year Aren't buying did those. not like the VIP yeah. idea at all. And, and it was a negative. And some people, you know, private message. And some people did it very you know, publicly. Very publicly. And we changed it. Yeah. Uh, another one was the food. And we changed it. Another one was the seating. They didn't want seats. Because we always, if you remember, we had seats. Oh, yeah, that's from right. From front of house to the stage. Yeah. And people were saying, listen... We're not coming there to sit down. Put the seats behind front of stage. If people want to sit down, they can sit down. But we want to be up like a concert experience. We want to dance. We want to hang out. We want to be able to come and go as we please. So we changed that. And actually, that was um, Carol is the one that pushed very hard for that. I was a little, little bit reluctant on that one. Mm -hmm. But it's turned out to be a, a great suggestion from our fan base. So we do listen to the negative stuff. It's just the ridiculous stuff. Yeah. Right? This isn't a blues fest. Johnny Lang's not blues. Please. <laughs> right? We get that. We get that yeah. all the time. I'm sure we're going to be told Eddie Money's not blues. Right. Vanilla Ice isn't blues. What? Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we got uh, a, a comment that, um, that um, Night Ranger and Extreme aren't blues. Well, that's why we call it Rock Night. Right. That's why we added a Rock Night yeah, yeah. to... to Cater to those people that that may not like. Blues. Love, not everybody loves blues. I love that Extreme is coming to this one. That one I'm looking forward so to I. that one, man. That's that Extreme's one of those bands that like gets me at like just the right age and the yeah. right time. And the, the 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 part with and this is totally off topic, just specifically about that band. What I loved about them was my experience in finding them because I heard them the same way everybody heard them was that more than words to yeah. song, right? This, Pretty little love song, yeah. and I'm 13 year old, I'm, you know, 13 year old kid, whatever, and uh, it just hits at the right age. So I go out and buy the album, and then find out it's this like monster metal album, yeah. and had no, and like I fell in love with it yeah. right away. Yeah. Great band, I can't wait to see them this year. Yeah. Um, one last question for you. You keep talking about all the challenges yeah. that that you enjoy with this. What what has been the biggest challenge through this entire process that you've had to face? Through the Blues Fest, the biggest challenge uh, personally that I have had is going from literally um, zero experience in dealing with agents and managers and, um, and that end of the business to immersing myself into you know, meeting agents, um, getting them, convincing them that we're the real deal and yes, we pay our bills and yes, we're going to pay the bands and yes, we're getting bigger and better because as you can imagine, when you... When you call an agent five years ago and say, you know, we're from Blues Fest Windsor, and they say, well, who did you have in years past? And you tell them, they're like, well, yeah, you're, yeah, you're not getting Bob Seger. Don't yeah. even talk to me about Bob Seger. That, to me, is the biggest challenge. So my role in this whole thing, um, just so that everybody knows, I get a lot of feedback from the team. I book the bands. Right. Um, and then myself and Jeff Burroughs and Walt Hansen are predominantly the ones that get corporate sponsors. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Carol and Jeff and their, and their entire team, which I can't name all of them, but they're awesome people, they take care of everything else. Mm -hmm. When the festival starts on Thursday at four o'clock, I deal with sponsors. I deal with the crowd. I deal with patrons that bought a ticket. That's all I do. 
I'm not even allowed backstage. <laughs> I don't go backstage. I don't have a, a radio to tell me all of the things that are going wrong because when I'm out there, it's like throwing a wedding, right? Yep. If I don't know what's going wrong, when I'm talking to the people out there, I'm, Everything's good. I'm cheerful and stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, when they're dealing with, oh my God, the plane didn't come in and the band's late and the band won't get into the limo because it's too old and... I, I don't know, the, the strawberries aren't ripe enough. Right. I don't have to deal with any of that That's stuff. It. They deal with the hard stuff. I get the fun stuff during the event. That's awesome. Peanut Gallery? All right. Rob, thanks for hanging out with us, brother. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.